Smith, and there's Ms. John Brisbane. Oh. Right. <laughs> Say hello to the people. Hi there. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, uh, Ms. McLean, for being with us. Glad to have you here from California. Uh, we also have at this time uh, Mr. Corder, Mr. John Corder of Enid, uh, who is uh, known to practically all of the residents of Northwest Oklahoma. John, how you doing today? All right. I see that you got a little tag on there that says you made the run in 1893. Is that right? Yeah. Where'd you run from, John? Caldwell. How far did you run? Well, I run down here to Turkey Creek. Turkey Creek? Where from? Uh, whereabouts? Uh, Caldwell. I mean, but uh, how, uh, whereabouts on Turkey Creek? Oh, from the south side of the uh, strip, uh, that's where we run. Mm -hmm. Now, where, where, at, where's, uh, where's your claim? That's what I'm getting at. Well, it's south of Lahoma, a mile and a half. South a mile and a half of Lahoma, and yeah. A mile east. And a mile east. Yeah. How did you run, John? What'd you, did you come horseback or in a cart or what? Well... We had a spring wagon that we come in there with. Mm -hmm. Who came with you? Oh, my father and I don't remember now who else it was. Three or four of us. A bunch of cowboys brought us in there from the south side of the strip. I see. And how old were you? I don't want to put you on the spot here, but how old were you when you came in? Well, I wasn't quite 21. Well, the uh, statute of limitations run on everything now. Uh, did, you, <laughs> did you stake a claim anyway? No. <laughs> I got my father's claim. I see. So you sat out there with your father. Yeah. Where'd you spend the first night, uh, John, on that claim? No. We went back up to Kansas, I think, that day. Up, back up to where we lived. Uh -huh. Well, you ran right on through the strip then, didn't you? Yeah. You ran clear across it that day. Uh, you've lived here in the Strip ever since, haven't you, John? Yeah, except one year I went back, when we got dried out, I, I went back up there and stayed one year and come back and been here ever since. Well, you live out here on West Broadway at the present time, mm -hmm. here in Enid. Yeah, 1310 West Broadway. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have uh, also with us here today, uh, Mr. L.H. Hickman, who made the run into the Cherokee Strip. Uh, where do you live now, Mr. Hickman? 1320 East Broadway. Uh, where did you run from? From, oh, I can't think of now, they're north of Guthrie. North of Guthrie. You came in from north the... Orlando. Uh, you came in from the south side, too. Yes, sir. And where, did you stake a claim? Stake a claim over here. We didn't take anything then, but took a claim over here where Ames is now. I see. You got a claim later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, just a few days, a day or two. Yeah. Was that uh, just a vacant claim, or did yeah. you get a relinquishment or something? No, that's piled on it. Uh, just a claim nobody took in the yeah. first day of the run. Uh, how long did you live there, Mr. Hickman? Lived there 15 years, that place. Uh -huh. And oh. I, I traded for one southeast here nine miles. I see. I still got it. And you lived on that ever since until you moved in Dina, is that right? right? Are you retired now? Yes, sir. Is your wife living? Yes, sir. How much family you got? Five girls. Five, five girls and, and seven grandchildren and six great-grandchildren. Well, another year or two, you probably have some great-great-grandchildren. I forgot to ask old John Corder how many kids he's got, but I know he's got a bunch, too, because right. I know a few of them. Uh, also, uh, we have in the room with us uh, today Mr. Uh, Webb, R.A. Webb. R.A. Webb. Uh, uh, you weren't, uh, you don't look to me like you were old enough to have taken a claim in the run, Mr. Webb. No, I wasn't. I was 10 years old when the strip opened. I see. But you came in with your folks that That's day. That's right, with my father. Mm -hmm. Where'd you run from? Carmel, Kansas. And uh, did you come in a wagon? Or yes, what? in a wagon. Mm -hmm. I, with my father. We went the second day after we were out. We, we homesteaded the place about 20 miles east of Woodward on the North Canadian River. I see. And uh, he went to Woodard and filed a soldier's declaratory, and then we went back to Kiowa. Mm -hmm. And that winter, he came down and built a one-room cottonwood uh, cabin. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next spring, we moved down and brought about 10 head of cattle with us and broke out uh, 20 acres of sod, and I dropped a calf of corn behind the sod pile every third furrow. I see. And we stayed there until uh, long in September. and. 
There was no neighbor closer than a mile and a half, and uh, my mother didn't like it very well, and there's an old Englishman come along, that is, he had come from England, but he was American now, a citizen, and we sold, he sold his, sold his declaratory for $250. The Pretty place, good money in those days, wasn't it? Yes, the place afterwards sold for 25000 Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, that soldier's declaratory you're talking about, that was a preference right that the soldiers that's had to right. take a claim in the strip. He was a Civil War veteran. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he also went on down by uh, in Dewey County and homesteaded another place. He didn't forfeit his right because mm -hmm. he hadn't used only his declaratory right. I see. Declaratory to file. Have you lived in the Strip ever since, Mr. Most Biden? of the time. Mm -hmm. Where's your family? It's 729 South Arthur Street. I see. You, you live here in Enid now. That's right. Have any children? Have a daughter. Lives, uh, her husband is uh, an army officer at St. Louis, Missouri. Oh, yeah. What's her name? Her name is Tucker. Roberta Tucker. Her husband's name is William G. Tucker, Major William G. Tucker. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Webb. Uh, Mr. R.D. Smith has just registered here. I see, Mr. Smith, that you have one of these uh, tags on you that says you made the run in 1893. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, where did you run from, Mr. Smith? From Marshall, the strip line north of Marshall. Did you get a claim? I did. Whereabouts is it? Two miles north of Marshall. Have you lived there ever since? I lived there until 19... 19. Where do you live now, Mr. Marshall? In Enid. Is your wife living? No. How much family you got? Two boys. What's their names? F.G. and P.G. Smith. Where do they live? P.G. lives in Houston, Texas, and F.G. lives here. I see. Uh, where, did you, wh uh, where did you stay the first night uh, after you made the run? Did you stay on your claim? No. Back to the, um, I had an uncle living on the line just inside the Oklahoma line, old Oklahoma line. I see. We'd been staying with him for about six months before the run. Mm -hmm. His wife was my father's sister. Well, that's down in present Logan County, Oklahoma. Yes, sir, down in present Logan County. And that had been opened about three years about before, the, uh, four years about before. four years before. And uh, he lived down there at that time. Yes. Had you been living in old Oklahoma before you came yes, up Yes, we home, we ran a hardware store at Hennessy from 1889 to 1903. I see. Or 1893, I mean. Yes. And then you made the run and started in farming. Yes. <clears throat> uh, what incident uh, of that day of the run stands out most clearly in your mind? What do you remember about it mostly? Well, I don't know that there was anything particularly interesting happened. How did you come in? On horseback? On or? horseback. Mm -hmm. Anybody with you? It was about seven of us in our little group. Uh -huh. And uh, to the east of us, about a half a mile, there was probably 200. Mm -hmm. And then to the west of us, about a half a mile, there was 50 or 60 more. And that's as far as I know it. The, the first thing I remember, after we got to the line, we had waited there about 15 minutes for the word, and I had just reached down to test the belly band of my saddle to see if it was tight. And somebody said, there they go. Well, I went with the rest of them. <laughs> then I had to put a good horse, and uh, it didn't take me long to get to the place where we had started to go. Yeah. We, four of them, the, my father, I wasn't old enough to take a claim, but I, that is to file on a claim, but I made the run and my father filed on the claim. And uh, when I got onto the claim, a uh, short time after that, I saw a man on horseback up at the north end of the, what I took to be the north end of our place. I rode up there to see what he was doing and asked him where he was claiming, and he said he was claiming north. Big fella on a horse. While we were standing there talking, an antelope pursued by two horsebackers came in sight just over the little hill west north of us. The antelope was nearly run down, and uh, when he got up to us, this man 
pulled out a big six-shooter and shot it. And uh, by that time, the two men rode up that had been chasing it, and of course, there was some discussion and about who owned the antelope. But this man was a Texan and looked pretty tough, so he got the antelope. He owned the antelope. He owned the antelope. <laughs> he shot it. But, of course, he didn't run it. He run. These men had run this antelope from Black Bear Creek, mm -hmm. about 12, 14 miles north. Well, that was nice of them to chase his antelope over to yes. it. <laughs> well, that's about the only uh, thing of, of any particular are, interest. Are any, any of those seven persons living that came in with you that day? Do you know? No, so far as I know, there's none of them living. Mm -hmm. This man that had the shot the antelope, of course, he was just in there as a boomer. He had no legal right in there. He sold his claim the next morning to a neighbor of mine by the name of Al Gingry for $50. Yeah. And got out. That's all he was up there for, just to make a little speculation. Get on a claim. He couldn't hold it legally because he, was, he lived in Texas and, and probably was so situated that he wasn't yeah. eligible to take a claim in this country. But he sold his, his, his interest in it the next morning to Mr. Gingry, who did, failed to get a claim. And well, then he disappeared from the scene. We had somebody on here a while ago that said those were the good old, oh, good old days. Do you yes, feel that way about I it? I do. I feel that way about yes, it. Yes, sir. All right. Well, thank That's you very much. Yes, uh, glad to have you with us. I see uh, among the people who are registering here, Mrs. W.W. Uh, w. English more particularly known as Maud to her many friends here in Enid. Uh, I don't think Mrs. English made the run, but I believe her husband did. Isn't that right, Mrs. English? Yes, he made the run. Uh, he has been dead some number of years now, hasn't he? Twenty years. Now, I particularly singled you out here today because I know that your husband, and uh, before his death and you since his death, have been very closely identified with the progress of Enid. And uh, I wanted something in these archives of our museum uh, mentioning his name and telling just a little bit about him. Now, he, uh, to my personal knowledge, uh, I know that he had a great deal to do with the development of Enid because every time I open an abstract, being a lawyer, I do that, you know. Yes. <laughs> I see his name someplace or other, uh, particularly in a lot of property down here south. I, I even see your name on some of that uh, development uh, down there. Uh, when did the, where did he come from, uh, Mrs. English? Well. Where did he live before the opening? He lived in El Reno immediately be right. before the opening. He went down there in the early days. Mm -hmm. And then he came down there from Kansas City. He lived in Kansas City before the? Uh, west of Kansas City in Wyandotte County. Kansas City, Kansas. Yes, right. Wyandotte County, that's and, right. Uh, and he uh, made the run into uh, the Cherokee Strip. He made the run with Dan Thomas. Yes, I remember Dan Thomas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he got the claim where the university is on. Oh, is that right? And Dan Thomas got the one between the university and Enid. Yes, I knew that. I didn't realize Mr. English had the claim the university was on. Well, he and that's did. Phillips University we're talking yes. about. Mm -hmm. But he, uh, before he got to file on the place, a woman who had filed on out west, southwest of here got in first and filed on that claim. I see. Did he lose it? Well, no, he sold it to her. Oh, he finally settled with her. For more money than he thought it was worth at the time. How much was that? Do you know? I think it was $800. Oh, that was a lot I of money in those days. It was. I didn't know him then, but he told me he got $800 for it, and he didn't want it. Well, he's a good businessman. We've been hearing about these people that sold their rights and their claims yeah. and so forth for $200 and $250. Yeah. He got a lot of money for that claim. Yes, he did. <laughs> of course, I suppose so. it's only worth about 100000 today, but uh, that's something well. different. But uh, he lived in England ever since, ever since the time he made the run, didn't he, as I recall? No, he went back to El Reno and stayed a while, and then he come back here, he and Cap Bond, and put him that I restaurant see. down there before I knew anything about him. Cap Bond. Cap Bond. Yes. You remember him? Yes, I remember Cap Bond. He was Bond. quite a character. Yes, he was a character. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, Certainly was. Uh, in what year did he die, Mrs. English? I've forgotten. 33. 33. August 24th, 33. And uh, what business was he in here in Enid? Well, after he went out of the restaurant business, he went into the real estate business yes, for a while. And then later on, he went on the road as a salesman. Yes. 
but he was back in the real estate business before he passed away, but he was ill for two or three years and he didn't do anything. Mm. Wasn't able. Well, of course, we've been talking oh. about your husband, Mr. English, and he was one of our prominent, very prominent early day citizens of Enid. But I don't want to overlook you, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that you're one of our outstanding citizens, too. Oh, no. And you've been identified with uh, many of the uh, great uh, movements here in this town and uh, been very prominent in club work and so forth and added greatly to the culture and the growth of our city, uh, intellectually at least. And I want that mentioned before we quit here today. And thank you very much, Ms. English, for being with us. I see a spry young gentleman here that I've known ever since I can remember. And uh, even though I know that uh, I don't believe he made the run into the strip, I want him to say a few words because he's known by everybody in the city of Enid and Garfield County, Oklahoma. Uh, Pop, how you doing? Oh, Jim. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I say Pop. Uh, everybody knows him by that name. His name is, is Evans. What is your first name? I don't think Charles. I... Charles Evans. Charles Francis Evans. They call me Chick Evans a lot of times. And uh, sometimes they call me Charles, that means a king, and sometimes they call me Charlie, which might mean I'm a horse. See, Charlie means a horse. Yeah, means well, a horse. the reason everybody knows you, you know, is because of that uh, smile of yours and the fact you've lived out there on East Main for some, so many years and the fact that you worked in the Vodder bookstore for so many years. And, and I'm still there, still in the bookstore. I've been, I'm rounding out my 45th year in this same bookstore. That's right. And what are you hanging around in there with those old timers for? You didn't come here till 1908. Well, I thought I might get the low down on some of the events of the early days when the settlers came in here, I see. and uh, that I went in in particular to see Prof. George and get uh, a little bit from him. But he didn't happen to be in. He is conspicuous by his absence today. Yeah. Well, he'll be around tomorrow. Well, I wanted, wanted you to say a couple of words, Pop, because I know your kids will be glad to hear you when this is broadcast on the radio sometime. Yes, right? no doubt of that. No uh, you've got to, glad uh, to have them do so. What's your kids' names? C. Coy Evans, who lives in Oklahoma City, and Francis Lee Fullerton, who lives in the Seton Village, New Mexico. That's seven miles south of Santa Fe. Well, I remember them well, and I and then hope they get to hear this sometime. Yes, and my daughter Valeria, who is at home with me and looking after me. That's right. She's my manager and uh, protector, you might say. I see. Well, thanks for coming in, Pop. You're entirely welcome. This is number one in a series of recordings sponsored by the Cherokee Strip Historical Society and to become a part of its permanent record to perpetuate in their own words and voices the individual experiences of many of those who made the run into the Cherokee outlet on sem September 16, 1893. This first recording is by Professor J.E. George of the Enid Business College, now president of the association, as an introduction to this series and is being recorded this 20th day of July, 1951, in Enid, Oklahoma. Professor George was born in Alcorn County, Mississippi, near, near the town of Corinth. He grew up on a farm in that county and was educated in the public schools in the state of Mississippi. He taught in the public schools in that state and graduated from business college there. He was employed as a bookkeeper and accountant, but having heard the stories of the fabulous country known as the Cherokee Outlet, he decided He taught in the public schools in that state and graduated from business college there. He was employed as a bookkeeper and accountant, but having heard the stories of the fabulous country known as the Cherokee Outlet, he decided to carve a future in this new territory and on January 11, 1904, arrived in the city of Enid. He enrolled in the Enid Business School here, which at that time was operated by one W. M. Stevenson. While there, Mr. Stevenson became ill and prevailed upon the young student to take over some of the classes in book bookkeeping and accounting. When Mr. Stevenson returned after his illness, Professor George stayed on 
and in a short time bought the entire establishment and has operated it ever since that time as the Enid Business College. Professor George is one of the outstanding citizens of the Cherokee Outland and has, and has through the years retained a great fervor and enthusiasm for this country and a wholesome sentiment concerning its beginnings. It is through the efforts of such men as he that the history and spirit of the Cherokee Outlet is being preserved and encouraged in the memories and minds of our citizens. Professor George. Thank you, Mr. Harry McKeever. I'm delighted to be introduced on this broadcast by a worthy son of a worthy pioneer of that early day. I'm delighted for the opportunity afforded as it relates to the celebration of the opening of the Cherokee Outlet. As you know, this took place on September 16, 1893, when the soldiers of the United States government fired his gun at uh, High 12. This is a day long to be remembered in the history of the Cherokee Strip. On that day, some 100,000 men and women rushed across Ferreras, over Knolls, and through the Dale to claim land on which to establish homes and carve new pos prosperity for themselves and the greater civilization. Uh, these men and women of the pioneer spirit came on horseback, muleback, and many kinds of vehicles through the heat and dust to gain for themselves and their posterity a new opportunity in a new land of fertile and virgin soil. This land had been uh, utilized throughout the years by the cowboy uh, with his cattle and the buffalo and the bison as they roamed this vast area of some six million acres of fertile land that produced a very nutritious grass. These men and women of conquering spirit came with a determination and resolve to wrest from this land their blossom and to cause it to produce its strength. They recognized in order to do this that there must be carried along in their other activities, the church and the school. So this Cherokee Strip opening day of September 16, 1893, uh, being on Saturday, the next day, many of the people throughout the length and breadth of this section met in groups out in the open to uh, praise the God of the universe and to worship at his shrine. How well these pioneer citizens um, wrought in all of their endeavors is evidenced in the hundreds of beautiful church homes and the vastness of their public education facilities uh, that uh, this day is uh, evidenced through the colleges and the universities both public and private of our land. Further evidence is found in the multiplied millions of dollars invested in homes, the beautiful homes and moderate homes throughout the length and breadth of this country from the east to the west, from the Kansas line to two and a quarter miles north of Hennessy, Oklahoma. Cherokee Strip uh, has long since been recognized as the wheat belt of Oklahoma, and Enid as the capital of the Cherokee Strip because of its strategic location and of its size, uh, readily developed into the wheat center uh, of the Cherokee Strip and of Oklahoma. Since September 16, 1893, it is a day long to be remembered in the history of um, this section of our country. It is well that it be fittingly commemorated and that our children and children's children be uh, taught the significance of this the 
greatest and largest run for homes in the number of people and the territory covered. It is of vast importance, I believe, that our citizens uh, present day be reminded of the worth of their efforts and the accomplishments uh, that they have wrought. Look into the day of perpetuating um, uh, these uh, memorable occasions and that that represent these occasions. The Board of Directors of the Cherokee Strip Association Incorporated under the laws of the state of Oklahoma uh, has appointed Mr. Harry McKeever as chairman with authority to select co-workers as a collector of mementos and um, relics of this occasion. And he has made rapid progress in this regard. And many have uh, extended their hearty in co cooperation. And the county commissioners of Garfield County uh, have set aside a large room as a temporary quarters for uh, these mementos and relics. This is only a beginning as we hope to, in some time in the near future, to build a home where these relics and mementos may be properly cared for. And we invite the cooperation of all pioneers, men and women, sons and daughters and grandchildren in this effort to collect these mementos. And also, we are very much interested in building what we might call the biography of uh, all of the pioneers that are available. We would appreciate a photograph of the pioneer, of the man or the woman who made the run and obtained the farm. We also appreciate a biography of the individual as to his birth and where he was born and number of children and a number of interesting points like that, that these things may be put together and put in this museum. Would you like to say uh, something in tribute to these pioneers, both living and dead, Professor? <laughs> yes, I um, appreciate very much uh, these uh, men and women. It's been my privilege for, for some 10 or 12 years to register these uh, noble men and women and to hear them express their appreciation and concerning the celebration and reminisce uh, about that early day. And certainly they were men and women of great courage. Certainly, they were men and women of high ideals. Uh, who are, whose examples are worthy of our emulation. And we, as younger men and women of these days, and uh, those of the sons and daughters would do well to remember the spirit of their dads and mothers who made this run. They are noble men, great men, wrought well, establish an opportunity for the younger generation to accomplish more and more. Thank you, Professor George. This is number two in a series of recordings sponsored by the Cherokee Strip Historical Society, and to become a part of its permanent records, to perpetuate in their own words and voices the individual experiences of many of those who made the run into the Cherokee outlet on September 16, 1893. Uh, this second recording is by Frank L. Hamilton of Enid, now retired, and is being recorded this 26th day of July, 1951, in Enid, Oklahoma. Mr. Hamilton was born December the 1st, 1866, in Washington County, Iowa, near the town of Kyoto. He grew up on a farm in that county and was educated in the public schools. He uh, came from a farm family. 
uh, who moved to Kansas in 1883 near the town of Norwich. He later moved to Argonia, where he was living in Sumner County at the time of the opening of the Cherokee Strip. He made the run and, and settled one and one quarter mile east and two south of Carrier, Oklahoma, on the northwest quarter of Section 30, Township 33, Range 7. Mr. Hamilton was elected Register of Deeds of Garfield County in 1902 and 1904. He engaged in business in Garfield County until in 1916 when he removed to Texas where he resided on a ranch until approximately 1944 when he returned to Enid where he now makes his home with his wife, Mary Lucy Hedgepeth Hamilton. Mm -hmm. He has two living children, Burton Hamilton, who now resides in Kansas City, Missouri, and is employed by the Long Bell Lumber Company, and Lucy Dean Stewart, who now resides in California. Long Beach. In Long Beach, California. Uh, Mr. Hamilton, you made the run into the Cherokee outlet, and I think you told me that uh, you came in from uh, the north boundary. Uh, where did you start the run? I started the Kansas line and run south on the Bitter Creek Trail, a Bitter Creek, what they call the Bitter Creek Trail. And I went south to, we came to uh, Blackwell's Ranch, just north of the Shikaska River. Is that where the town of Blackwell now is? No, sir. The Blackwell town is about three miles south west of his old ranch. We did not go to the, the Blackwell at that time. We went on south to about three miles southeast of Tonkawa, where Tonkawa is today, and uh, we made the trip 27 miles down there in two hours and seven minutes. You say we. Uh, who was with you, Mr. Hamilton? My uncle, C.C. Welton, my mother's brother. How were you traveling that day? We had a, a, a team of horses hitched onto a skeleton road wagon, a buggy, and uh, we was prepared to make the race I went there three days ahead of time, so to be on that uh, Bitter Creek Trail with her tongue, a buggy tongue, right on that spot. <laughs> yeah. So when the fire fired the guns, we made the race. And, and we went south 27 miles. That was high noon on a Saturday, as I recall. Yes, high noon <coughs> Saturday. What kind of a day was that, Mr. Hamilton? Oh, it was a terrible, dusty, high wind blowing from the south. You go just dust of flying, everybody running across the fields, prairies there, and you just couldn't hardly breathe on account of the dust. Were there a lot of people that came in right there where you did? Oh, yes, 10,000 made the race. Right, right there. Right, right there. there in two or three miles mm -hmm. across there. Now, you were headed for some particular spot, were you not? Yes, sir. I, I, a cowman told me where to make the race to get a, one of the best claims down there on the Salt Fork where they had timber and spring, an old cow ranch. And he told me he used to work there and for me to get that claim, and I made the race. Well, when you got there, what did you find? Well, I found a tent, and a yoke of cattle hitched on a breaking plow, and I saw a man and about 30, and a wa woman about 30, both had 45s. When we dropped in on them, why they could run out and commence saddling up their ponies, and one stood guard while the other saddled and the other saddled later, but there's some, they didn't both saddle at the same time. So you and your uncle decided you better move on, is that well, right? Well, we just figured to let the horses rest there and under the shade mm -hmm. tree and 
Then we returned. And as we returned, we didn't get very far till we found a man that shot a deer. And he said, if you would stay here a few minutes, I would fry you a piece of venison. Well, I had never tasted any venison, so I said, I'll be glad to get it, and that'll give my horses a little rest. And we did, and then we moved on, and as we're going over the ferry towards Blackwell, we saw two men shooting at one another, and the second shot, one of the men fell. In less than five minutes, I'll bet there's 50 men there. We went on, and we went on to Blackwell and left that bunch by itself. Well, shooting always draws the curious. Yes, uh, sir. And a lot of men showed up quick, even on the ferry there, there. They was digging a well. Two men in the well was digging, and three men pulling the dirt out, and they struck water about 6 o'clock that night. There's Where no water it? in the country. Where was that, in Blackwell? Blackwell, mm -hmm. the new town of Blackwell. Mm -hmm. And then we drove on up the Shikaska River and camped that night. Mm -hmm. And the next morning, there was around 150 head of horses dead along that river banks. What caused Foundered that? Foundered and run too hard or something. I don't know what. They all laid along there. And we went on home, Uncle and I, and he, we got back to Argonne, and he went on over to my father's ranch over in Harper County. And then the, on next Tuesday, why, Joe Jagoo, had filed on land down here at Carrier in that neighborhood, and he told me if I'd go down there and make out the papers, I could get a quarter section two miles south of him, that they'd had it mixed up in the land office. One part of it was filed on, the other fellow said they wasn't filed on, and they was arguing while they was filing. And I made the race down there as fast as I could go, and, and I got my official number stamped and I got a horse on the south side of the square and rode out and staked my claim and 11.20. You came from Argonia to Enid and uh, yes, got sir. the necessary papers made out by some attorney here. Yes, sir. And went um, right on out to get your claim. And I went right out and got my claim. And um. I proved it up and sold it to Perry Murphy. What year did you sell it? And uh, February 14th, 1898. Would you mind telling us what you got for uh, that good land out there? I in those got days? $960. That is a big price. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did it have wheat on it at the time? Oh, yes. I had a, been a trying to farm out there. I had about seven bushels on the year before. And that year it looked bad, and I, well, I think $40 a month looks better to me than farming out there. And so I came in to Enid and went to work for Cunningham and Cropper in the hardware store. Jesse Butts was the implement man, and I had the charge of the hardware. Well, let's go back now to the day you filed on your, you went out to your claim there. Uh, Yes, sir. Didn't you tell me uh, some of your friends later came out that day? No, it was the, about the second day. Oh, I see. They come in. My turned out to be my brother-in-law later on, Ed Shields. He came and made the race. He heard about that claim. Ed was later sheriff here, wasn't he? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but he wasn't of age. He lacked a little of being of age. And then... About 30 minutes later, here come Perry Murphy from the same neighborhood up there at Argonne. Uh, they'd heard that that claim was to be filed on right across from Sarah Shields and Jake Hutchison. And I was there building my home when they landed. And I gave Perry Murphy $14, and I told him where I could file on the claim over where he there. Could file here. And he went over there and drove over there and looked at it, and he filed on it. And him and Ed went back to Argonne. Mm -hmm. Well, you told me something a while ago about uh, two Ranicky people, Ranicky Bill and Ranicky Phil. What was that story? Well, about? they come up from Hennessy. They was uh, genuine horse thieves, 
and uh, just rob anybody or do anything. And they drove by my place and uh, come out there and when I was building my house, they said, where are you from? I says, Kansas. Uh-huh. Well, where are you going to be? Oh, you, uh, you haven't got any place to stay tonight. You better come go with me over to the our ranch, just uh, our place, right over the creek here, over the hill there. Well, they drove me about four miles, and way over in southwest of Cary, or now, where Cary is today. And uh, I slept between two of those murder outfit horse thieves that night, and I had $165 on my hip, and a 38 caliber, and they had 45s to head to their pillow. <laughs> Put me in the middle. And I got up and that next morning and walked four miles to get home. And, and the next night, I just stole all of my lumber, and hauled it away, and I had to go to town and get some new lumber. My frying pans, doors, and windows, and everything, they stole everything I had. And I was pretty much put out by that bunch, and we organized the neighborhood there to stand guard for those rascals. We had to keep our horses tied to wagons in the night and, and watch that they didn't come in and steal them. Uh, tell us a little something about the appearance of this country uh, before it was settled up. Uh, well, it is all prairie, and uh, I can look out of the morning and see antelope north of my home, about halfway between my claim and Joe Jagu's, about a mile north, there's antelope. You could see the white, uh, yellow spots on them. And then about some of an hour high, they'd go to the timber and down to the creek to water and they'd stay there till the next morning. And coyotes and everything was plentiful. There was a lot of wild game in those days, oh, wasn't yes. there? Yes, sir. Of course, the buffalo had disappeared oh, from yes. the country at but that there time. there was deer and, uh, and antelope, plenty of coyotes and such as that. But I have heard that this country was covered with the buffalo wallows and the buffalo bones when the settlers settled here. Is that right? Yes, sir. I've heard that some Lots people made a living picking up the bones and... Uh, I know my cousin came down from Kansas. He used to make his living picking up bones and hauling them to Wichita, what Kansas. Did, what did they do with those? They uh, ground them up and made fertilizer or something. I don't know what. But that's the way they made their living in early day and they tall bones and cedar posts up to Wichita. That was an early day, 75, 76, long in there. Well, now the land office here was on the uh, east side of the public square in the south block, isn't that right? Yes, sir. And there were quite a few lawyers that made a living off of these. 84 of them. Made off of uh, contesting claims, more or less. Yes, sir. That was their hobby. And uh, you had a little experience with some of that, didn't you? Yeah, I sure did. Uh, your claim was contested? Yes, sir, it was contested, and, and we'd come in and with our, our witnesses, and they'd just take one man a day and cost you $20 for about th five minutes, and then you could go wait another day. And they'd want the attorneys to come in and settle it. They didn't want to, and it, it was all a game of, help yourself and get as much as you could and so on, but at the same time, they wanted to be very reasonable. They told me they could settle it for $50. Well, that had cost me 70 and I made me sore, and I just fought it out till I had to borrow $30, and I give 60% a month for it. 60%? 60% for $30. <laughs> Found a man that had $30. Well, you told me that you had a witness about your settling, that uh, some fellow rode across your yeah. land there when you were settling it? Yes, it was, it was Willie Stunkel, Billy Stunkel from Sumner County. He'd filed on the land out 
Northwest of Carrier. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he's the father of Jess Dunkel here in England. Yes, sir, he was his father. Mm -hmm. He saw my state. Did you use him in your contest matter? Did he testify for you? Well, no, I never had to use him. I had other witness to prove that that woman from that contested me from Watunga never was there. Uh, how many people do you think uh, were in Blackwell that first night that you well, got it, there? Well, the town was pretty live with people. And of course, I don't know how many, but they laid out quite a town there that day and staked their claims and everything. And uh, the trouble was they didn't have no water. And that yeah, they got water that night. And well, it's been said that there were over 10,000 here in Enid the first night. Uh, oh, I wouldn't wonder. Yeah. Do you think there's anything like that up there? No, I don't think there's, well, about 2,000, I should judge, of Blackwell. Mm -hmm. It was quite a crowd. Covered uh, about a section of land around there, camping and everything. Well, you didn't have a sod house on your claim to begin no, with. No, I you put started up a board house. You put a board house up yes, right away. Right away. A box house, what you'd call a box house. And you lived there till 1890. Nine, I believe you said. No. Ninety-eight? Uh, Ninety-eight. Mm -hmm. February 14th, I come to town. That's when you moved into Enid? Yes, sir. And of course, uh, at that time, I wasn't around, but at that time you were one of the Democratic wheel horses, so to speak, yes, weren't you? Yes, sir. I was, I was elected delegate to Brian's homecoming in New York City in 1906. And I was a delegate to Wilson's inaugural in 1913. And you've been interested in democratic politics ever since? Oh, yes, for 60 years. Well, I think that our time is about up, Mr. Hamilton. All Thanks right. for the interview. This is the fifth in a series of recordings sponsored by the Cherokee Strip Historical Society to preserve in their own words and voices the experiences of many of the pioneers of this region. This recording is by Mr. Fred W. Buttrey and is being recorded this 18th day of August, 1951 in Enid, Oklahoma. Mr. Buttrey was born in Sterling, Illinois, February the 17th, 1869. His parents were Thomas Buttrey and Jane Wright Buttrey, both of whom were born in England. The family moved to Wellington, Kansas in 1879, where Mr. Buttrey Sr. entered the shoe business and built the Phillips House, the first hotel in Wellington. Uh, Mr. Buttrey moved uh, to Oklahoma City when he became older, where he worked for a time on the Oklahoma City Times. After a short sickness, he then moved to Wichita, where he clerked in the Cash Anderson dry goods store. Mr. Buttrey came to Enid and made the run on the train from Hennessy. He entered the grocery business immediately thereafter in Enid and engaged in that business for a number of years here in this city. He married Annie McCannis of Wichita in the spring after the opening and the two now live in their home at 724 East Main in Enid. Uh, Mr. Buttrey, uh, you told me that uh, you went through the strip the day before it was opened and then got on the train down at Hennessy and made the run on the train. That's correct, isn't it? Yes, sir. <coughs> Tell us a little bit about that trip up on the train. What did the train look like? Well, it looked like any other uh Common freight train, there was a lot of uh, mostly cattle cars, long train. Train stood at the uh, border, the strip border, just north of Hennessy for an hour or so. People piling on. Engine itself was covered with as many men as could stick on it. 
front cars were crammed full of men. What kind of cars were they? Uh, cattle cars, mostly. I was uh, in a cattle car a little further back, but not quite so many fellows. A man drove past, was driving past the long driveway behind a good-looking team with a spring wagon, waving his whip, shouting, ten dollars to Enid, ten dollars to Enid. I was uh, dropping down out of my car to run and get rid of my ten dollars when uh, Pop went the gun, that early gun, and off went my man. You mean the gun went off early on the south border there by Hennessy? It said that the gun went off about ten minutes. Somebody shot, and, and we were all swimming. So well, it said. Well, the train waited till the legal train, time, didn't it? Train waited until the proper time, yes. And uh, 